Hey everybody, Rob Mauer here, and today we are going to be talking about a new configuration for the Model Y out of Giga Berlin. We've also got a couple other updates on Europe, some news on Tesla's Model S Plaid, and more. Nice slight outperformance from Tesla stock on the day today, finishing up four tenths of a percent to $161.20, while the Nasdaq was down half a percent on the day. Getting right into the news then, we've got a report today from teslameg.de that Tesla is beginning production of a new configuration of the Model Y at Giga Berlin. We know that Tesla in Europe does offer the rear wheel drive Model Y. However, currently that version of the Model Y is produced in Shanghai and then imported into Europe. Now the report from Tesla Mag is that Tesla has started production on a similar rear wheel drive smaller battery capacity Model Y at Giga Berlin. With Berlin now hitting true volume production and hopefully continuing to ramp up from here, I think the timing makes sense to expand to a lower price Model Y. And unlike the rear wheel drive version from Shanghai, Tesla Mag is reporting that this version will be using front castings in addition to the rear castings similar to what we see on the 4680 Model Ys from Giga Texas. Instead of using 4680s though, the report is that these vehicles will in fact feature a battery from BYD. So over the last year or even two years, there had been various reports that Tesla was going to be using BYD batteries. At one point we had a report that that was no longer going to be the case because of safety concerns. Elon then came out and said that that report was not accurate and that the relationship between the two companies was strong. So if today's reporting is correct, it would make sense why Elon was refuting that at the time. In terms of the specs of the vehicle, it sounds like it'll have roughly a 55 kilowatt hour pack and a 440 kilometer WLTP range, which is just a bit less, about three and a half percent less than the current rear wheel drive configuration from Shanghai shows. So it'll be interesting to see how Tesla manages the introduction of this vehicle. If production is really starting right now, presumably that would happen pretty soon, but it is slightly different spec than the Shanghai version. So Tesla will have to manage around that from an ordering and allocation perspective. And if this version is ramped up quickly, again, that's going to open up supply from Giga Shanghai that will need to be absorbed in another market. Of course, we recently talked about a similar configuration being added to the Canada Design Studio, and it looks like those are going to come from Shanghai. So that news, that maneuver likely being done in relation to the news that we're hearing in this report. Then, of course, as we talked about before, that absorbs supply in Canada that otherwise would have been fulfilled from the U.S., and then those vehicles ultimately have to find buyers somewhere else, too. So hopefully that makes it very clear how expanded production in Berlin can affect prices in the United States as that opens up supply ultimately in the U.S., and it should be clear why eventually that will allow for cost savings, but those don't appear right away as production is ramping, but they should come over time and that will add to Tesla's structural cost advantage. The other update that we've got on Giga Berlin comes from an article from MOZ shared on Twitter by Berlinergy, and that is that according to the Brandenburg Ministry of the Environment, a new groundwater supply has been found near Giga Berlin, which could help ease some of the concerns that there have been around water usage for the factory. So good news on that front, hopefully that'll make some permitting needs for Tesla in the future a little bit easier. All right, sticking with Europe, now that we are a few days into May, most countries have reported registration information for the first month of the quarter, April. And Roland Percher on Twitter has done a really good job aggregating this data. In this chart, we can see the registration data for the first month of each quarter in these countries historically compared to the second quarter here in 2023. So this quarter, off to what seems to be a pretty strong start with easily a record for a first month and about a 50% increase from January, the first month of Q1. However, as Tesla grows Giga Berlin production, as they continue to push for unwinding the delivery wave, this should be expected, and in the middle of a change like that, it doesn't really mean much in terms of how the entire quarter is going to come in, as we saw in China in Q4. In fact, bringing in the context for full quarters, we actually saw this happen last quarter in Europe, where the first month of the quarter, or those green bars at the bottom, started off really strong on a quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis, but the entire quarter as a whole came in as a sequential decline. So point being, there's a lot of quarter left. The first month has not proven to be a very good gauge of how the total quarter comes in. I'll definitely take the increase. That's better than not seeing that, but it doesn't mean a whole lot yet. And I think we're still waiting to see signs of more strength in Germany and the UK, which were really drags in the first quarter. All right, next we've got an update on the Tesla Semi. According to reporting by Automotive News, Pepsi yesterday confirmed that they would be entering Tesla Semis in an event called Run On List that takes place over three weeks later this year in September. One of Pepsi's directors about the decision said, quote, we're really excited to participate in the run and allow the industry to have access to the insights and the learnings that we are getting from experiencing these vehicles. We're going to run them hard, end quote. The event describes itself as showcasing electric trucks in everyday operation and says that both their previous events featured real-time monitoring of a number of factors, including miles traveled, 
fuel consumed, pickups and deliveries, elevation change, and vehicle speed, among others. So this should be a really good opportunity for third-party monitoring and verification of some of the claims that Tesla has made about the semi so far. Sounds like they'll be posting some of this performance data on the website following the event. And Pepsi has said that they're going to operate the truck at a maximum payload and travel up to 500 miles round trip during this event. It might end up being the final nail in the coffin for some comments from Daimler a few years back implying that the semi's announced specs would break the laws of physics. Next up, Tesla today announced that the track package for the Model S Plaid is coming soon. According to their website, it looks like this will begin deliveries in June, which appears to be very similar to the ceramic brake kit that was previously available. Looks like this now includes a set of tires as well, and it unlocks additional track mode software options for the Model S Plaid. Right now in the US, Tesla is listing this as $15,000 to $20,000. It sounds like there's still a little bit of homologation needed for Europe. Sounds like that'll be happening pretty soon, but this package is also what is needed to unlock the 200 mile per hour top speed for the Plaid. All right, next I wanted to briefly touch on a few comments from other automakers earnings calls earlier this week. We have some comments here from Ford and Stellantis that I think are interesting. Of course, we talked about the financials from Ford earlier this week. They lost $700 million on their EV business. In their earnings call though, they said that they are quote, on track this year toward a contribution margin approaching break even in Model E and for our first generation products to be EBIT margin positive by the end of next year, end quote. So that implies that right now their contribution margin is negative, which means each additional electric vehicle that they build and sell is actually causing their losses to increase, but towards the end of the year, that would start to be close to not being the case. Sounds like that would then flip pretty early next year, and then they view the contribution margin to start to become large enough to cover their fixed costs as well towards the end of next year. Compared to the negative 100% EBIT margin that they disclosed this quarter, they expect that towards the end of the year, that'll be around negative 20% instead. Obviously, a lot of that will be driven by scale, and then they also noted that their expectation is that from the beginning of production for the Mustang Mach-E to the end of this year, they will have reduced the bill of materials cost by $5,000 per vehicle. Now, of course, they've also cut prices for the Mustang Mach-E probably by roughly that amount in the last couple of months. So they were asked about that, asked about competing with Tesla on price cuts and what their strategy was there. And CEO Jim Farley replied, quote, it depends. Well, first of all, our first three EVs are all very different in terms of pricing. I think the Lightning's price is up $11,000 since we launched and E-Transit is up a lot. And of course, we're increasing production to get that scale benefit. So the most important thing we've learned from three or four years ago is be careful where you compete and we have selected where we compete extremely carefully. We want to go after segments where we have great reputation, but there's a lot of Conquest customers, end quote. So basically saying, yes, Mustang Mach-E prices have fallen, but look at the Ford F-150 Lightning, look at the E-Transit where there's not as much competition, we have pricing power there. So the lesson seems to be pursue those things more aggressively, which is fine when there's not as much competition in those segments, and that's a good thing to do. There is some first mover advantage there, but that doesn't go very far in terms of creating a sustainable competitive advantage in their EV business. So it was kind of interesting to hear that response. And then I also noticed a similar sentiment being echoed in the Stellantis earnings call when they were talking about many of these same things. They said, quote, and so far we haven't made any moves as a result of the competitive moves. I think our products are very competitive in the segments they operate in. We're not directly competing with Tesla that much today in the segments we're in. So we're holding our price positions and focusing on managing our profitability across the portfolio, end quote. So Ford basically saying we would have picked our segments more carefully to be in less direct competition with Tesla. Stellantis is saying we don't think we're in direct competition in terms of segments with Tesla. I guess those things kind of work for now a little bit, but that answer is only going to be a viable answer for so long. The last thing from the Ford call, just kind of thought it was amusing. Ford talked about one of the things they're doing to drive costs down is monitor vehicles from a digital connectivity standpoint to see what features customers are using and what they're not, and then designing out things that are not being heavily utilized to help on costs, which, hmm, that does sound pretty familiar, speaking of passenger, lumbar support, and many other items. All right, last item for today then, we do have an announcement from Waymo that they have increased their coverage in the Phoenix area, roughly doubling the service area to 180 square miles in that region. They also announced that they are now serving 10,000 trips per week to public riders, not including employees, and they are targeting increasing that number by 10 times by next summer. So obviously these businesses, not without their faults, not without their problems, but Cruz, Waymo now starting to scale up a little bit more significantly, which as that happens, despite the differences in strategy, I think it adds a little bit more pressure incrementally on Tesla for FSD beta. 
So we'll continue to monitor progress there, but that will wrap it up for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you tomorrow for what is actually Friday for the May 5th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.